Welcome to the Michael Cooley podcast on rethinking leadership. In these episodes, we will look at leadership with a fresh perspective and take your leadership effectiveness to the next level. For more information, go to cooleyinstitute.com and follow Michael's continuous learning insights on social media. So has the practice of leadership in the public sector changed over the past few years? I believe it definitely has changed and it is changing dramatically now and it will change even more in the 10 years to come. In fact, I believe we are living in transformational times when it comes to the practice of public leadership. And I can tell you this from different perspective. I spent around 30 years in the corporate life exercising leadership, mainly as a CEO. And I've also spent considerable time in the media industry where I could observe how society and the government and the businesses you know, and the entire perspective at a country level and a global level were evolving. And I've also spent years helping people from the public sector and the private sector build their leadership capacity. These people included ministers, included prime ministers, and in some cases heads of state, and in general, senior members of the government, in addition to people from the private sector. And what I can tell you is that through my contacts, my ongoing contact with some of the people who have been, I have coached and trained, in the subject of leadership, I can see that their lives, their professional lives, the way they have been practicing public leadership has been dramatically changing. I mean, I'll just give you an example. Imagine um, somebody who is working in the health ministry, a minister of health, minister of education, somebody who is heading a media organization that is in some way or form associated with the government. All of these Imagine them practicing leadership or exercising leadership, conducting their activities during the COVID-19 period. Can you just imagine how the health ministry has been functioning in these definitely challenging times. You can expand this to include other kinds of ministries like, like finance and the economy. The entire spectrum of the government and public administration and the public sector has been under tremendous pressure over the past several years, even before COVID-19, to transform itself and act in a completely different manner. This has not been just a small or gradual, the usual evolution that happens, you know, over the course of time by default. We're talking about serious transformation. It started from the late Um, 2010 after the Grand Recession, the big recession, and then moved gradually and slowly into the end of this decade. And then you have the big, the big, big event, the big dramatic event that happened with COVID-19 that completely, you know, um, shook the planet and the way we live and the way we uh, perform businesses and the way we conduct government and the way we uh, exercise leadership in the public sector. And I expect that this will continue over the next several years. So if you are a CEO running um, or a director or a minister uh, or somebody, a senior at the public sector running an organization that um, that belongs to the government, you need to really think about what is coming and so that you have, you adapt yourself to fulfill whatever is required to exercise effective and and practical and applied leadership so that the purpose of your organization, the purpose of your service is achieved. Now, why is this so? Why has uh, the practice of public sector leadership transformed 
over the past years and why is it likely to transform even more? Because of a number of reasons. Life now is not the same as it used to be in 2010 or in year 2000. And definitely it will not be the same as it is expected to be in 2020, 2030. In general, the trend of life is that things are becoming more and more complex. And when you have a more complex context, right, that is uh, covering the entire spectrum of life, including public sector, you have to adjust to that, in, in, especially in terms of practicing um, your leadership in the public domain. People, there are more people now, and over the next several years, there will be even more people. So not only you're having more people to, to deal with, but the demands of these people will also increase, and not only increase, but also change. So you have also that dynamic that is happening with the increasing population and the changing um, nature of their needs. As we can see, the increasing collaboration between the public and the private sector. This has been um, obviously uh, evident as uh, the government of the entire world has been, um, pro has been encouraging uh, health industry um, sectors to be more active and to cooperate more so that we can, so the whole humanity and these governments can deal better with the issue and the challenges of COVID-19. And you can cascade that to many other industries, hygiene industry, surveillance industry, and you name it. So all of that is demanding a stronger cooperation between the public sector and the private sector. And that requires different kind of skills on both sides, on public and private kind of leadership. Ten years ago, technology was at a certain stage. Now, uh, when we used to talk about artificial intelligence, now it's a reality and it's creeping and integrating itself more and more into the fabric of the way we exercise life. In year 2030, it's going to be much, it's going to go in a much deeper level. So you can't exercise leadership in the private sector and in the public sector if you're not aware of the impact of this technological change. Uh, these leaps of technological evolutions on the way you're conducting your activities. People now are connected. They know how services are provided by various governments. They can compare things. They know how it is done in various countries and in developed countries. And based on that, they have expectations. So the public sector is under increasing pressure to meet the expectations of the people when it comes to being more efficient, faster, more productive, more satisfying to, their, to the changing needs of the public. And a major element in that element of competition is the readiness of the public sector to provide the services that are required by the investors. Because of the economical challenges, because of the pressures on the economy, you know, countries are looking for more direct foreign investment. Mm -hmm. And to do that, they provide, they have to provide the best possible infrastructure when it comes to government services so that this direct foreign investment would find its way into their countries. So that competition is increasing further, right? The pressure on the public sector to upgrade itself. In fact, um, not just upgrade, to be creative and innovative so that it can perform in a way that would bring all these benefits to the society that it's trying to serve. So in general, we're really talking about the demand and the need for a complete shift in the mindset when it comes to exercising leadership in the public sector. And in my view, we're talking about something that is going to be a hybrid between uh, exercising leadership with a private sector spirit with a private sector mentality and exercising leadership with a classical you know, public sector mentality. There will always be differences between the private sector and the public sector. The private sector serves you know, a defined 
amount of shareholders seeks profit increasing shareholder value you know it looks short term at things the public sector it serves a different purpose you know it looks at the entire population um, it follows the agenda of the government it has to apply the overall strategy uh, of the government and for of the country it, link, it thinks more long term so there will always be differences but when it comes to exercising leadership and the skills that are required to do so effectively and efficiently and productively I see that what is required now in the public sector domain when it comes to leadership is a hybrid model a hybrid model where some of the best part of the corporate culture are integrated into the culture of the you know public sector so that you get the best of both worlds and so that society could be served in a better way and if you are a CEO of a public sector organization if you are a minister if you are a deputy minister if you're a prime minister to survive and grow and succeed in your job in delivering the promises that you have made and in meeting the expectations of your authorities right you have to be aware of this and you have to develop these new sets of capabilities so that you can not just succeed succeed and compete and thrive and even exceed expectations of your constituents and also become a driving force that is pushing uh, the community and pulling it forward into more progress and into more prosperity Public sector leadership will require a more creative aspect of leadership. Why do we need that? Because the nature of the problems and the challenges are dynamic and are changing. We are not in a static situation where problems or the same problems continue to repeat themselves. We are living in a time where the name of the game is continuous surprises. Every morning there is a new thing coming, there is a new crisis unexpected events are happening the nature of reality every day is changing in complete uncertainty and ambiguity and that creates a set of problems that are new now how do you solve a new set of problems one of the important elements you, you need to do that is creative thinking so creativity in terms of exercise leadership, in terms of mindset, in terms of thinking, in terms of culture is very important to deal with the challenges of exercising public leadership. It has been usually the case that CEOs and directors and you know managers in the private sector live and work under more stress than those in the public sector. Well, go back again to the COVID-19 era. Imagine the stress that ministries of health, of education, the media, um, security, uh, economy, finance are going through just to cope with these new pressures, unprecedented pressures. So imagine the stress there. So it's important, very important, vital for leadership to succeed in the public domain that the personal resilience of people who exercise leadership, who are at the helm of these you know, government organizations, develop extreme levels of personal resilience. Now, that is an entire science by itself. There are techniques of how to do that, but we're not going to go there. The point is you need to develop personal resilience. So the personal leadership aspects when it comes to exercising leadership in the public domain is now more emphasized so that you maintain your focus, your sanity, the sharpness of your mind, the effectiveness of your intervention, the wisdom, the decision making process, your creative thinking, the way you take care of yourself, you maintain energy, you give hope, you manage crisis. All of that is under the umbrella of personal leadership, self-leadership that comes under you know taking care of yourself as somebody who is exercising leadership in the public domain
just like in the public in the private sector uh, the business has to become has to be customer centric in the public domain the CEOs, ministers, prime ministers, heads of states, they have to become citizens centric. So gone are the days where, you know, governments put 10 years, 15 year plans, and then the people um, have to adapt to these plans. Life has become so interconnected, so dynamic, so fast, so unexpectedly changing, that you can't have these rigid plans anymore. So you have to keep an eye on your citizen, on their evolving needs, on the way their life is changing, the complexity that they're living into, and remain dynamic enough so that you always, always focus your attention on how you meet these continuously changing needs. So the name of the game is, just like customers come first in the private sector, citizens come first when it comes to running the uh, public sector institution. Let's go back to the COVID-19 case study. This is not a case now where the health ministry and the education the ministry of education and the media could work independently. Because to deal with the health challenge of COVID-19, you need to communicate with people, you need to create awareness. Media has to play a major role in creating that awareness in society. So media is never has never been as important as before when it comes to coordination and interaction with and wake, working with and through and for right if it is publicly owned for the government and for the strategy that's running the entire public domain in the case of covid 19 media was the main instrument in keeping people informed and in creating campaigns of awareness right in in educating people on how to uh, deal with this pandemic in giving uh, the government feedback on how people are feeling so all of these boundaries that used to be you know as create silos between the different institutions of the public domain have now been uh, at least uh, if not broken but at least they've become more and more transparent. And to exercise leadership in the public domain, you have to, you have to work across boundaries. Uh, people in the media, they have to work closely with people in the health ministry, in the education ministry, in the finance, in the national security you know, ministry, uh, with the government in general, with the leadership of the country, so that all of them are orchestrated in harmony to become more effective uh, a system or apparatus in the service of the citizens of this community and the country. It is, it is natural that you know public sectors have strategies and medium-term strategies and long-term strategies. That's the nature of the public sector and government. But because of the nature of the increasing dynamism of life, Sometimes you have to be tactical in adjusting your priorities, especially when it comes to crisis. So you have to become very f flexible. You have to become malleable. You have to become extremely adaptive in changing your priorities so that you're always in touch with reality and you can be responsive to the needs of the day or of that stage of, uh, of, uh, of or, or that time or that period of your life. This is not a stage where there is, you know, one man knows all. Somebody is, you know, if you're the director or the CEO, then you can claim that you know it all, right? And you, then you can claim that you know it all and that uh, you're the s source of all solutions and, you know, everybody comes to you. It doesn't work like that anymore. This is not, this is not, this is la la land thinking. You have to create and build the right team. Nobody can do it alone. These challenges cannot be held and dealt with alone. Go back to the COVID-19 case study. The, the WHO, the United Nations, uh, government leaders have continuously been speaking about the importance of cooperation and collaboration between countries. So imagine this is at the country, you know, inter international level. Now cascade that on a domestic level. You can't do it alone. People have to work together. So you have to create teams within your department 
and ministry as a CEO or a minister or prime minister, you have to build the right team. And also across other teams, you have to do that. It depends on the nature of the challenge and it depends on the nature of the crisis. So leaders uh, for the coming decade in the public sector, in the public domain, have to build right teams. They have to know how to cultivate um, new leaders. This is super important. You have to cultivate more leaders. That's your primary job. In fact, one of the main elements or criteria of your success is how many leaders have you cultivated and what's the quality of their leadership. That's super important. You can't now not be transparent. Of course, not in everything because there are government you know, secret and there are certain dynamics that the, st the overall strategy of the administration um, has to apply for the best interest of the public as per the priorities and the vision of the top leadership. But in general, between departments, between ministry, ministries, um, between organizations that belong to the public domain, there has to be more transparency so that better cooperation is done and, bet and between that and the public sector. And here comes the role of the media so that it can become a successful and effective mechanism and medium so, uh, so to transmit data, to take data from the government to the public and from the public to the government. So transparency is of ultra importance as we go into the you know the new decade from 2022 in 2020 to 2030s and beyond when it comes to the practice of public leadership you can't play with ethics because you're in the eye of the public this is they know no ultra ethical every time you betray the ethical and the moral standards norms and values you have betrayed the entire population you have betrayed the entire community of your citizens because you are in principle in the service of the population in the service of the power service of the public so issues of being ethical and moral and to the higher standards of ethics should be absolutely at the center of the practice of leadership when it comes to you know exercising leadership in the public domain They have to remember that they're accountable, that when you make a mistake, you know, in a private organization, you make a mistake, some people pay the price and maybe some of the shareholders. When you make a mistake in a public domain, the entire population or your constituency pays, a, pays the price. So the concept of accountability is super important. And if you are a public sector leader, you need to keep this in mind, that you are constantly accountable. That's why you need to be ethical all the time so that you're clean and that's why you need to be transparent so that people can see what's happening and that will improve you, uh, your chances of exercising good leadership because it will increase the trust of people around you your constituency your people your colleagues and your superiors in your capability of exercising conscientious and ethical and moral leadership in the service of the population that you're trying um, trying to serve As we have seen since 2010, after the, uh, the big recession, till now, you know, the pro uh, fluctuation of the oil price, there has been pressures over the government, you know, on most governments to cut, um, to reduce expenses. And that requires that people who are running these administrations, ministries, prime ministers, you know, um, uh, CEOs of government, uh, government owned organizations become more intelligent in the way they manage finances, in the way they manage costs, in the way they optimize uh, the operation, in the way they create more efficiency, right? Being more in a way being more productive with the least minimum cost and you know use of resources. And if it, if it is a situation where this organization also is engaged in activity that generates revenue, they have to be smarter in creating uh, new streams of revenue as within the strategy of the organization and the government, right? And they have to be smarter in managing uh, this revenue so that the money 
that is coming in, the funds that are coming into this organization are optimized in their use. So this is not a situation where you know you get the budget, uh, uh, you get you given a certain budget, and all what you do is just spend. No, um, you need to be, uh, you need to borrow some skills that come from the private uh, leadership culture in managing the finances of your organization, whether it's a ministry, whether it's uh, any organization that is owned by the you know by the government or by the uh, public sector. The IT department in your ministry, in your public sector organization, should not be there just to fix computers and communication lines anymore. You have to have an IT department that is a pioneer in understanding technological advances and in coming up with intelligent, smart, effective, creative, innovative ways to integrate technology, the most advanced technology, into the way that you exercise uh, your, you provide services to your constituency, to your, to, your, to your citizens. So whatever it is that you're doing, regardless of the nature of what you're doing, technology now is not, is a disruptor even in some cases. So you need to be a master of this uh, domain in the sense that you understand it, you're fully up to date, and you're absolutely brilliant at in incorporating it and integrating it into the way you're providing your community and your constituency with services. So it's not a classical way of using technology. Technology now is a major enabler and in many cases a disruptor. And if you're not if you're not in touch with what's happening in technology, artificial intelligence, logarithms, you know, the way you use data uh, and the way you distribute data, the way you integrate this into the media, social media, digitalization, you know, um, using different kind of platform, uh, the way you uh, customize things, personalize your services, then you'll be out of touch. So technology is an important aspect. This old aspect of you keep all the knowledge for yourself. This is this is so old-fashioned and so 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 dis so destructive. Because number one, it's not your knowledge. This is not your organization. This is not a privately held organization. This is this belongs to the people. This is this belongs to the government. So whatever you know, the more the um, the more whatever you know, you have to be very intelligent in passing on the information. There's, there has to be a continuous process of transferring knowledge. You have to transfer knowledge so that people around you know what's happening. And not only knowledge, you have to know how to cultivate skills, especially when it comes to leadership. Because you need to create new leaders who are informed so that you use your own department, your own ministry as an incubator for leadership that can cultivate leaders and send them to other ministries. People who work in the public sector usually stay in the public sector. Sometimes they go to the private sector, but most often they stay in the public domain. So when you are transferring knowledge, when you are building leadership capacities of people around you, right? when you're cultivating leaders, you've made, you've just made your, your department, your ministry, whatever department or government organization you're running into an incubator, into sort of an academy of leadership that will, that will send in the future, that will transform this knowledge, these kinds of leaderships, right, into where? To other administrations. So you have to have holistic thinking that when you're doing your job, as a CEO or a minister or a prime minister, you're you're not you're, you're not just doing it for the for the present time, but you're doing it for the, in the for the future by cultivating leaders that will go across the entire public sector of the country. You lead per, by purpose, and you know there's so much literature about purpose-driven leadership in the private sector, but there's nothing more. Um, uh, comprehensible and obvious than purpose-driven leadership in the public sector. Like, what could be the purpose of a health ministry, right? What could be the purpose rather than improve the quality of life of the population of your country through improving the quality of health services? 
what could be you know a more obvious service, purpose than for the uh, Minister of Education than to improve the quality of life in the country by improving the quality of education. What could be a more a clearer uh, sense of purpose for a media organization that belongs to the public domain than to inform the public, than to educate the public, than to entertain the public, than to spread and establish the values that you know the country is built upon, right? The, the values that hold the main strengths of the culture of the country. So all of these are clear purposes when it comes to the public uh, sector uh, domain. And when you exercise leadership as a leader in the public domain, you have to keep this in mind and use purpose as a main leadership tool so that you can mobilize your people, so that you can mobilize them. You can do what you want to do if, as a public sector leader if you don't include people. So you have to have inc an inclusive leadership culture that makes, that makes everybody involved so that when people come to the organization, when people you know, are part of this organization, all of them feel that they are playing an important role in fulfilling the purpose of this organization that is in the service of the population. So you have to lead with an inclusive mindset. You know, we usually, it's, we know about the tensions between the public sector and the private sector in attracting talent. And this varies from country to country, depends on many factors. You know, the pay scale, uh, the future, the way the, cult the cultures are different. But in general, as uh, leadership in the public domain is becoming more and more challenging, and as you will need more and more leaders around you to create a team of leadership to fulfill your purpose, you need to attract great talent. And that is an art by itself. So when you lead, make sure that you create a culture that attracts this talent and knows how to keep them and knows how to nourish them and knows how to cultivate them. And that's a science by itself. And in many countries, it's a challenge. In other countries um, where they have worked in improving the culture of the public sector, it is considerably easier. But still, it's a main, main task of exercising leadership in the public domain. If you can't create an energetic environment, a friendly environment, an environment where people would not only like to join but will be eager to come to work every day, you know, out of this classical uh, picture we have about uh, unmotivated uh, people who work in the private, in the public domain. So, so out of that picture, that classical picture we have, uh, where people are not motivated to work in the, you know in the public domain where they're bored reading newspapers just wasting time you have to create an environment a culture where there's enough energy for people to be eager to come every day to work so that they contribute into the fulfilling the purpose of your you know your ministry your department your government your uh, public sector organization so that they can take part with motivation, with energy, right, in fulfilling the purpose of this organization, which is in the end, in the service of the people themselves. It's classical to think that, you know, ministers communicate with ministers, uh, uh, deputy ministers communicate with deputy ministers, and there are very rigid protocols when it comes to communication between the various elements and parties of the public uh, sector. That, of course, has its reason and history, and it's understandable. But if you look at the current reality, if you look at you know, what's coming in the next 10 years, you have to be able to maneuver yourself right, and collaborate beyond this very strict hierarchy. So you have to talk in all directions. You need to know how to cultivate relationships with peers. You need to know how to cultivate relationships with subordinates. You need to know how to cultivate a relationship with your superiors, not only in your department, not only in your field, but you need to extend your relationships 
to people in other organizations as well that are next to you, your sister organizations within the public domain, so that as a result of that, you can create more synergies and you can save time and energy and become more efficient and you can provide far better results right through the process and the benefits of collaboration. So collaboration b beyond hierarchies and beyond boundaries. What does networking mean? It means establishing productive, healthy, you know, relationship across the entire board in all directions, horizontally and vertically and diagonally. Because you will never know um, what situation will emerge that will require that your department, your organization, your ministry cooperates with various different ministries. Depends on the nature of the challenge or the mission or the crisis. So through the power of the network that you develop, you can extend this benefit to, to make this cooperation far more effective. Last but not least, I want to close by saying that we are living in transformational times when it comes to the exercise of leadership in the public domain. Absolutely no questions about that. And using COVID-19 as a case study is, is, is more than obvious in how this is happening. And I expect that over the next 10 years that things will not slow down. Things will cascade. This is not, this is not a once only crisis that you know, came and, and will disappear and then life goes back to, to what it used to be. You know, we keep talking about a new normal, a new reality, and this is going to be as evident as it is in the private sector as it will be in the public sector. And that will mean exercising leadership in the public sector will have to be different, based on a different and new mindset that takes into account all the elements that we have spoken about. You do that and you'll be successful. You do that and your society will appreciate you. You do that and your leadership will be, um, will be thankful. You do that and the quality of adaptation, the quality of life in your community will be, will be much better. It's a big challenge, but I don't see that we have a choice when it comes to this challenge. If you want to be a successful CEO, a minister, a prime minister, you have to have a major, major shift in your mindset when it comes to exercising leadership. And you have to make sure that people around you adopt the same mindset. Because in the end, it's all about the ultimate purpose of survival and growth in a changing in environment. And for that, you need to develop, you need to uh, adapt, and you, you need to evolve. And what better times to manifest that than these times? Thank you for listening to the Michael Cooley podcast. Please visit cooleyinstitute.com and send us an email. We would love to hear your comments and thoughts on this episode. And remember to follow Michael's continuous learning insights on social media.